G'day and welcome. Um, Foment's fourth pitch day um, and uh, I'm keen to get on with it. Before we do that, I'd like to acknowledge that the live um, event today is on the lands of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. I'd like to acknowledge them and their elders past and present. For everybody online, you're meeting in different parts of Australia and possibly around the world. Um, we'd also like to acknowledge the elders of that country. Um, Carl is on full screen. Um, so, Carla and I facilitate the program, uh, but there's a, a large team of people who are involved behind the scenes. Um, Colette's over here, Ron's here, Ellen's here somewhere, Angela's here somewhere, and the rest of the team at Flinders University. They, there's a, oh, of course, um, Rafael, who does our AV every year. So, I'd like to acknowledge all those people. Um, thank our judges who will get introduced later on um, for coming along today and giving their time so generously um, and our advisory board. Uh, but I'd like to hand over to Carla to say g'day and to um, talk about some of our sponsors. Thanks everyone. Thanks Darren and welcome everyone to uh, the fourth final pitch event of Foment. Um, Tech for Wine, Tech for Wine Tourism, Tech for Viditech, Tech for the world and Australia. I think now we became a world recognized brand um, and it's very exciting to see that we are going live, not just to Australia, but to other countries in the world. Um, it's been a, a really uh, interesting journey from the beginning. Uh, many thanks to obviously Hydro Consulting, who uh, has been a uh, Flinders partner uh, from the beginning, as well as Wiser, the Wine Industry and Suppliers Association. The three of us uh, four years ago decided that this was uh, something that could revolutionize the wine industry in Australia and in the world. And uh, we are now here with just um, amazing group of participants which just shows that uh, we had the vision uh, and we persisted to implement it and and we it, it, it actually worked so thanks everyone for your support and we couldn't have done it without our sponsors um and a big thanks to our sponsors um the entrepreneurs program with Oz industry um with the department of industry science and resources from the australian government that in collaboration with I4 Connect, uh, uh, we were able to to get that that sponsorship, um, and obviously Wine Australia. Big thanks to uh, Wine Australia, who also has been there from the beginning, believing in our wine tech revolution. And great to have um, these sponsors on board with us for so many years. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to be uh, with the participants throughout the, uh, I think, seven weeks um, of the program. Uh, we've done everything. We, I think uh, you all have been fantastic. Uh, we've gone through uh, some learning sessions, some immersion um, sessions in the Barossa and in the Adelaide Hills and uh, also the opportunity uh, to visit the Cube in Darnberg in McLaren Vale. Uh, we've been through, you've been through coaching sessions with Darren. You've been through uh, some uh, special uh, mentoring sessions with our mentors and also uh, uh, met with our advisory board sessions. It is a very complete program, um, and I could not thank uh, our advisory board, our network of mentors all the support team that we have with Foment uh, uh, to be here today and to see how much these participants have grown. I think you'll see that in their final pitches. So, so thanks very, very much, everyone. And um, I'll pass on to you, Darren. And I'm just going to be here really excited to see everything unfold. So speak to you soon. Um, I want to really thank every everybody who made this possible, but I'm going to focus on the people from the wine industry because this is something that the wine industry gets behind. Um, so I'd just like to thank uh, both Darrenberg and Chester's Mind for their ongoing contribution to this, um, probably our most entertaining visit every year. Uh, Treasury Wine Estates, Barossa Winery and Wolf Blast Salador, Pernod Ricard, St Hugo and Jacobs Creek Salador, 
Oak Solutions, Redhead Wines, Aurora Glass, Soul Growers, CCL Labels, Yolumba Nursery, Tobrek, Murdoch Hill and Simon Tully Wines all open their doors to us every year and give us several hours of their time. As Carla said, we've got an advisory board that meets twice um, in order to provide an external view of how the teams are going. And we have mentors um, and speakers from around the world who come and work with, um, work with the participants. Uh, the participants this year, we have a, a slightly different program in that we've got both a little bit of um, the accelerator program, which is the six week accelerator, and a couple of companies that we're accelerator slash incubating. So we've got pictures from, from both those groups today. And we start with the accelerator slash incubators and work through to the accelerator, plus two teams who have graduated previously. I'd just like to make sure that both Grant and Vajish understand uh, that they're not up for a prize today. Gentlemen, I'm sorry, you've, you had your chance when you went through the accelerator the first time. So we've got um, uh, Lardo, and Anzor from Mikado Wines, uh, the Republic of Georgia, um, participating as an accelerator slash incubator team. Eva and Gregory Zolozzi from Kikoi, uh, they'll be presenting in person. Jay Halada from Athena IR Tech will be presenting in person. James O'Hearn and Sydney Mazzi um, will be presenting virtually uh, from New Zealand and potentially the UK. Um, Andrew Kersley, from Oxen will be presenting from New Zealand virtually. Avron Rubin from Rubay Wines will be presenting in person. Robert Little and Chris Cook from Certified ID Technologies will be presenting both virtually and in person. Um, and I'll leave you to uh, figure out which is which. Um, Mishi Zhao and Simon Zhang from Vinox are from New South Wales virtual. <coughs> Grant Baker from Brick and Mortar, a um, Past program alum um, will be presenting in person, and Vijesh, say, oh, Vijesh, I'm going to get your name wrong. Sathya Neeson from Circular Farms will be presenting from New South Wales virtually. So, congratulations to all those teams for um, for the teams that are in the program this year for how much you've progressed during the accelerator period, and for the teams who are coming from past years. It's always exciting to be involved with you guys and watching um, how your businesses are growing with time. It's my job now to hand over um, and disappear off into the sunset for a little while um, to Liz Shearn. Liz Shearn is the Deputy Chair of Wine Industry Suppliers Association, um, one of the three partners in the program and thanks a lot Liz. Thanks very much, Darren and Carla, and um, good afternoon. Yes, as Darren said, my name is Liz Shearn. I'm um, an independent wine business consultant and deputy chair of WISER, the Wine Industry Association, um, Suppliers Association. My love for all things Venice started when I started my um, Bachelor of Wine Marketing about 20 years ago, and I love the fact I'll never stop learning, um, and today I'm really excited to learn more about what the future can look like for our industry. Um, I'd like to thank also the steering committee, facilitators, guest speakers, mentors and support team involved in deliver uh, delivering this accelerator program and introduce the, the jury today. So we have on the jury David J.D. Sheard. J.D. is the managing partner and founder of Verka, Vertka. Elaine Stead. Elaine is the chief investment officer and co-founder of Tribe Global Ventures. Josh Garrett. Josh is a startup community leader with a passion for Industry 4.0, Urban Technologies Automation, IoT Big Data Analytics and Sustainability. Ron Van Buren. Ron is the Managing Director at Hydra Consulting and the Chair of Foment. And Paul Smith. Paul is a Senior R&D and E Program Manager at Wine Australia. Um, just a few housekeeping items to begin with. The um, toilets are located on the left of the lifts. In case of an emergency, emergency exits are located on, it, on each side of the lifts. And Raphael is our fire warden. Um, smoking is only permitted outside the building. Alcoholic beverages must remain inside the building for drinks afterwards. Please drink responsibly and have a wonderful afternoon. 
So welcome to the Foment Accelerator Pitch, where innovators in the field of viticulture, wine and tourism technology will showcase their game-changing ideas. This afternoon, as Darren said, you'll hear from our 2023 participants and alumni, Makadu Wines, Kikoi, Athena IR Tech, Tate Technologies, Oxen by Smart Machine, Roubaix Wines, Certified D Te Technologies, Vino X, and past program alumni, Bricks and Mortar, and Circular Farms. After the pictures, please savour the afternoon with some nibbles and a glass of wine as well, for those here in person. In its fourth intake, Foment is the world's only accelerator program focused on wine, viti, and tourism technology. By providing resources, mentorship, and connections, Foment helps businesses drive change in the wine industry. Brought to you by Flinders New Venture Institute, Wine and Industry Suppliers Association, and Hydra Consulting. Proudly supported by the Australian Government and Wine Australia. Foment is proudly supported by Oz Industry through the Entrepreneurs Program Accelerating Commercialisation Service in conjunction with delivery partner I4 Connect. Our 2023 participants and alumni will each have a five minute presentation pitch, followed by three minutes of Q&A with the jury, uh, roughly about two questions, and then we'll have a two minute setup time for the next pitch. And to begin with, I'd like to introduce Mercado Wines as the first pitch, and please note they're not pitching for VC investment today. Australia and Quivity, bringing Georgian Quivity wine culture to Australia and introducing the original and ancient way of making wine to all Australians. Quivity is a clay vessel intended for wine fermentation and aging and storage, which gives rise to completely different aromatic profiles in wine and is commonly associated to the amber wine style. Hi all, my name is Anzo and I'm joining you from Brossa Valley and Lado is joining us from Georgia and we are here to bring something special and ancient to our shores. We want to bring history and culture to life. We will set up an ancient wine cellar, showcase the method of winemaking and foster engagement between wine lovers and wine style. Creating emotion. The idea is when stepping over the threshold into the space, it would feel as though you have traveled through time to the origins of wine. Exhibitions of ancient winemaking tools and artifacts with explanations of practical and cultural significance. We will give intimate tours of the space and provide educational experiences for all levels of wine knowledge, seminars for history lovers and engaging and layered tastings for the wine connoisseurs. And offer the unique space to celebrate special events in quote unquote, a new and alternative way. Could you imagine all the rustic Instagram photos? Visitors can purchase replicas of traditional pieces for later at home use or gift it to friends and gain an opportunity to tell an incredible story themselves. We can offer training for other producers to increase their knowledge around quivity and certification of high level knowledge in traditional clay based winemaking. In 2013, UNESCO acknowledged Georgia as the first winemaking nation in history, dating back more than 8,000 years and awarding it the status of intangible cultural heritage of humankind. This made quivity an overnight sensation and sparked huge international interest in the wine world. Quivity has been the catalyst for putting Georgia on the map for tourism. It has increased wine exports from Georgia to Western countries by more than 700%, tripled tourism in, to Georgia to 11 million people per annum. That's three times the local population. The consumer has evolved. Engagement between consumer and product has changed. They want to know that businesses are socially and environmentally responsible, but most importantly, they want to connect with the people behind the product. The discovery of ancient wines is followed with a desire to connect more deeply in a culturally genuine way. They crave an authentic story. And we offer authenticity threefold, an authentic product made in an authentic method and the story told by an authentic voice with deep cultural connection. The transition of preferences to choosing more natural wines is evident and it's seen in wine too. And it is shown by approximately two thirds of consumers in Italy and Spain choosing natural wines as their wine of choice. Aussies are following this trend. Organic wine is tipped to become the norm in Australia and with sales experiencing a massive rate of increase, 
What currently represents 0.42% of the market is valued at $31 million in the retail category. Therefore, consumers have looked to traditional winemaking styles like Georgian Cuevri and Portuguese Thalia. An ongoing challenge for producers is that although they are delivering an authentic engagement with their product, they are missing an element of culture and history to go with it. This is where our Cuevri concept rises to the challenge. Great products and great experiences tied together with a thread of history. We will bring the origins of wine to our shores, and we are so excited to show our passion and dedication to this style of winemaking. 8,000-year-old Cuevri winemaking will be at the forefront of this concept. We will not only be the Australian industry leaders in this category, but the driving force behind building a significant Cuevri culture for all of us to enjoy. Our boots on ground team consists of Lado, with an abundance of experience in the industry, a uh, passionate young winemaker, yours truly, and Rajesh Singh of Wakefield Chartered Accountants, providing high-level accounting and financial analytics. And we have further support lent to us by Cuevri makers and artifact producers and specialists of authentic Marani from Georgia. Our five-year projection, a lot has incurred in the first year, as hospitality operations will not have commenced until later in the year. However, we can look forward to going in the green in year two. Please note this concept projection is based around the leased property. If real estate were to be bought, this would change the figures where above financials would be in positive in year three or four. To summarize, we're expecting to see a steady increase in performance for the first five years of operations and initial returns on investment in year three. Overall concept valuation is 2.7 million. Cuevries are supplied with a value of 200,000 and current partner investments of another 200,000 accounted for. This will result in a finance requirement of just over 2.6 million. I'd like to thank you all for listening. Cheers. Uh, cool. Thanks, Enza. That was really good. Where, where's the um, where's the tourism experience or the, the, the vineyard? These are all the same location, I'm guessing. Uh, yes. So the space would be intended to be in um, Clarenvale. Um, we think that they're the most open to new experiences and um, new concepts. Uh, Adelaide Hills also follows this trend, but McLarenvale, given the current climate, um, would be the best option. They have easy access from the CVD with the new highway and freeway, and tourism there is growing quickly. Um, so we'd, we'd be shooting for McLarenvale. Yeah. And so the, the path to market, like how are you accessing your, your visitors and your customers? Path to market um, would be, you know, social media marketing, um, attempting to get into wine stores, bottle shops, and, you know, exports and local sales is, is our main lines. But predominantly our target is to bring people to the cellar door and to the to the space to enjoy it. We want it to be an experience. Um, we want them to connect with the history, the product, and the whole idea. Uh, hi, Anzo. It's uh, Ron Van Buren here. Um, thanks again for your time yesterday. Um, just a, a quick question around the training and certifications. Sure. Uh, I know it's only early days yet, but uh, what's your intention on the certification side? Is that going to be via an RTO or you're going to go through a uni and do a micro credentialing sort of approach? I think a micro credentialing would be um, the most suited to this. Um, it's just bringing our knowledge of the winemaking techniques and trying to spread that knowledge across across Australia and across all producers. We think it's a great great winemaking technique, producing great styles, and it's something that potentially is lacking here in Australia at the moment. It is growing slowly, slowly, but we'd like to see it with uh, more precision and a higher quality of product. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Makati Wines. That was really interesting. And I'd now like to introduce Kikoi. Um, please note that Kikoi are currently open to pre seed. Hi, everyone. I'm Greg, and this is Evie, and we're CMARC. Uh, we're part of the uh, Kiko Group uh, from McLaren Vale, and we're making grape mark and seaweed byproducts into a packaging board. We see a potential application for the prototype in bottle dividers, 
tree vine guards and labels. We're pitching today to, to potential customers and seeking R&D grant and subsidy support. Make fertilizer, not waste. Everyone already knows the nasty, toxic problems when it comes to waste. The enormity of the problem is really just too much. A product to waste status quo. Packaging waste makes a third of all waste. Only 50% of recyclable packaging is actually recycled. So it doesn't matter if you make something recyclable, like the government has legislated for 2025. If it's not getting recycled, it just ends up as waste. And there's sadly already a term for this, <laughs> wish cycling. So people have been disillusioned, and rightly so. 80% of households are unclear when it comes to the recycling process. But they want to do the right thing. Wine producers want to reduce their waste. They want to reduce their plastic use. But they are just struggling, like the rest of us, to respond to the challenge. But not for a lack of trying, but for a lack of a viable alternative packaging solution. But this is an opportunity. By providing an easy choice alternative product to customers willing to demonstrate their environmental commitment. Taking small steps to break down this enormous problem into digestible little pieces, and for the soil I mean that literally, is a place to start. All RC Mark Board's ingredients will be from 100% waste streams. We're waste to product, and at the end of its life cycle, will turn into fertilizer around the vine, in your backyard, or as a compostable waste in your green bin. And even as litter would be fertilizer. Through bottle dividers, vine guards, we could be a circular economy for wine producers, of which there are 80 just in McLaren Vale. And this wouldn't need to be reprocessed in order to be recycled. We would be manufacturing locally, making fertilizable boards, not waste. Our product is simple, it's just grape mark, a natural carbon waste product of the wine industry, rich in potassium, almost too rich, combined with a seaweed byproduct, our binding agent, rich in nitrogen and phosphorus, produces a stable, firm, easily adaptable board, our Seamark board. A cardboard-like product, just <laughs> no toxic nasties just limitless possibilities. When within 12 months of its life cycle, CMARC will break down into fertilizer, won't break down into waste, and with the future potential to go structural and load-bearing. We are partnering with Marine Bioproduct CRC, so by late 2023, we will have a viable prototype. During the research phase, we'll be investigating new and suitable applications and uses for our CMARC board. We're launching our product locally in McLaren Vale. We have plans to expand as our product is scalable and transferable to other industries immediately, but we'll be focusing firstly on hospitality, retail and agriculture. It's all part of the key code. And through our partnership with MBCRC, we are also working to extract great mark bio components for their antioxidant and anti-inflammatory qualities. And whilst this is a longer process, the research will be happening simultaneously but looks very promising. Now, traction, this is something that in the last couple of weeks we've <laughs> really got behind us. We've got pre-seed funding. So we've got research funding. We've got a source of seaweed already set up. We are kind of the source of grape mark. And we even have a small place to manufacture small quantities of the prototype ready for shipment. And what's even more exciting is we actually have a large scale manufacturing plant ready to go by 2024 to continue this product. Now our team. CMARC has the privileged position of having a diverse set of individuals with interchangeable skills, and that's why we have come so far, so fast. We encourage honesty, innovation, and creativity. MBCRC is a renowned biotech industry leader with world-leading scientists producing new and sustainable products from the marine environment. Our ask, it's simple, make fertilizer, not waste. And we're just seeking R&D grant support
for product development, we would like to engage with potential customers who will be early adopters to be part of setting up our product direction and initial trials through the research phase. We would like to start discussions with seed investors interested in the commercialization phase in 2024. Because you have a product that connects ocean with earth, that promotes synergy and encourages collaboration. Thank you very much for your time. Hi there, great presentation. Uh, I love being able to reuse a lot of the waste there. Um, with that in mind, where does that, what does the process look like for actually from a manufacturing point of view? Will it be competitive with traditional packaging materials or will the cost be greater, less? Yeah, thank you for your question. So we, we plan to be a market player, meaning that uh, we would like to make this happen um, regardless of the of the financials to begin with. We are at a very early stage. We looked at the financials and um, as, as you heard from the presentation, the uh, components, the seaweed and the grape mark are nearly free. It's waste. So cost of goods sold is, is down. Um, revenue streams are there. We already had uh, uh, customer feedback, 100% positive feedback from customers. They are willing to implement the product, not in 2024, but immediately. So the need is, is there. So as long as the customer doesn't have to pay um, a huge premium, then, then it's good to go. And also we, we are really hoping to um, and talk to government bodies to, to um, kind of establish some sort of um, subsidization for the product. Um, last night, just um, last night, our daughter came up to us and uh, she said, mommy, we collected data from the school, 16,000. Um, Ziploc, Ziploc bags are being used in a year just at Tatachila School. And um, we are imagining that the government would step in and subsidize some kind of a lock bag for, for fruit, for kids. So we are really hopeful. And um, yes, um, it's, it looks very promising. Um, <clears throat> thanks for that. Um, I'm curious about the R&D side of things. What do you think your short-term needs would be around R&D? What would you focus on? So uh, the research and development phase, um, if I may just go on um, further, sorry. So this is just an appendix of the presentation. So um, MBCRC is, is our partner, so we have a <clears throat> pre-agreement in place, um, CMARC Research Collaboration, um, research would uh, probably need around uh, $200,000 uh, to make this happen in, um, until the prototype is ready. MBCRC is providing 50% 50, uh, 50 of the funding um, and we are hopeful that CVID companies, industry players are uh, providing some funding as well. We have a pre-seed funding so uh, because of the collaboration with Kikoi our team is ready and, and um, set up. Um, from accounting through marketing um, IT. Um, it is a synergy among um, the team players. Um, and 2024, that's when we need to look at um, further funding. I mean, we are seeking funding now because... We're we'll be seeking, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's it. You know, it, it's expandable. It's definitely a very transferable, very easily to be transferred, I think, into many industries. And that's what just even coasters, you know, anything can be, and that's what we're going to be researching. So while that's going on, you know, CMARC, which is a VR company, will be uh, investigating uh, avenues that we can follow further down the track to make this something that is not just making small components, but generally, hopefully, long-term goals of you know, producing everything. That but it also, also means, sorry to interrupt, also means the more we put in, the more we get out. So if we can speed up the product development by uh, bringing the research ahead for the bio components, for other adoptable products to other industries, we uh, really, uh, really would like to make that happen earlier and uh, grants and sponsorships very welcome. Yes. Collaboration is key. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Kiko. And I'd like to now introduce Athena IR Technologies. That was it. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jay, and I'm from Athena IR Tech. And we have a solution for farmers of any irrigated crop who value optimizing their water use efficiency. And in addition to that, they will look at that instead of just trying to understand and measure how much water is actually available in the soil to them. This is important in our current environment because in the recent history, irrigated farmers in Australia have had to manage through more frequent and more intense water constraints. That's one thing, but if you look at how it's been happening, it's been done on a less than optimal basis. And a study coming out that came out from the Australian Wine Research Institute in 2021 about irrigation practices in the wine industry showed that on average, 73% of grape growers in the Murray Valley and the Riverland are still relying upon their experience, the weather forecast, digging soil pits, and vine assessment to determine when they should irrigate. Only about 50% of them are using something as simple as soil moisture probes. That's the unfortunate paradigm that we're living in right now. But what if we shifted that paradigm? What if we started looking at the plant and let the plant tell us when it needs to irrigate? What if we had a simple and automated method of monitoring how well the plant is transpiring throughout the day and then use that information to tell us, to let the plant tell us when to be irrigated to optimize its photosynthesis? Whoops, did I go? Sorry. We do that with our solution, and our solution is called Transpire. And it's a combination of a device that is in the field using infrared technology that monitors how well the plant is transpiring every 10 minutes throughout the day. That data is then sent up to the cloud, where our proprietary algorithms process that data. In addition to that, we define for the grower then what we call the optimal plant water status and give it to them in this green zone on the screen. Then what we do is we generate the crop water index on a daily basis for the growers and overlay that as the blue line on this, basically showing the grower how well their vines are performing or transpiring in relation to what the optimal zone is. And then the grower can use this information to determine based on how well the plant is transpiring when they should irrigate that plant, that crop, to optimize how well it's photosynthesizing and its water use efficiency. Now, when we talk about optimization, in side-by-side -side trials we did with Cabernet Sauvignon over the course of the past few years, we saw that using our solution would increase the water use efficiency of Cabernet Sauvignon grapes by up to 35%. That was interesting, but it jumped to 70% when it came to Shiraz, and there was no degradation in the yield or the quality. That was us being able to simply take advantage of understanding the physiological differences of those two cultivars within that crop. That got really interesting when we started giving our units out to growers in 2000 and 2021 and 2022 season. We actually gave them, we actually gave growers 32 units. And um, those growers used it for the whole season. At the end of the season then, those 32 units we gave away actually turned into renewed paid subscriptions from those growers. And it wasn't just that. Those same growers actually added another seven units. So those 32 units that we gave away turned into 39 units that were actually paid subscriptions. That's 120% renewal rate. We think that's kind of fantastic. And in addition to that, during that same time, we actually had 41 new units and their subscriptions purchased from us with little to no marketing from brand new customers who just got the word that it's something interesting to work with. 
So this is where we've got some great customer traction based on some really unique and differentiating technology, but then also the business model that goes with it is something that's simple and becoming more well-known within ag tech, the hardware as a service concept. So where the grower is paying for the device and then they renew a subscription each year, basically. This is our team. We've got a great set of complementary skills of business acumen and research, scientific research. I have a background of a senior, as being a senior executive from Constellation Wines Australia. I was also a partner in Accenture's practice in the US, and I've owned a, a vineyard in McLaren Vale. Dr. Vinay Pigay is our chief science officer, and he's a senior lecturer and researcher at the University of Adelaide, and Dr. Fran Dorflinger is a horticulture research scientist. She's our director of ag research, and she's currently at doing that job while she's also at the New Zealand Institute for Plant and Food. What are we looking for? A little bit of help to help us right now along the product market fit journey that's gonna go on for the next 18 to 24 months. We need $650,000 and we're willing to give up about 16% of the company in equity to do this. In the very near term, we're looking to use that money to develop, to manufacture and distribute the next generation of our Transpire product, as well as we need to bring on board some customer, a customer engagement person that's gonna work hand in glove with our customers to help them really truly understand the value of this unique technology. We also need to, we also need to invest in a bit of sales and marketing, bring a bit of the team behind the scenes, and also put a little bit of money into our enterprise to make this process of buying and marketing and using the software a frictionless process for the customer. We finished that starting in 2024 then. We're gonna start looking towards the market in the US, focusing on the California Central Valley market entry point only. Our, our solution works on any irrigated crop only after we do the research on that crop to understand how that crop behaves in various water, water stress situations. We currently have 12 grape varieties available. We've got almonds, navel oranges, Valencia oranges, and we also have mandarins. All crops that are in very high demand, only in the, not just in the Central Valley of California, but throughout that. In addition to that, we'll be doubling down next year and strengthening our position in Australia with those crops. Thanks for your time. Thank you for that, Jay. Um, you, you actually just answered one of my questions, which was, do you have to do new analysis for every new crop or cultivar? Um, but I guess following on from that then is, how long does it take to do that analysis? What's the spin-up time before you can roll this out for a new cultivar or crop? So to add a new crop, what we have to do is follow that crop for a growing season. And we have to ground truth a number of parameters about how that crop is actually going through various water situations. So it all depends on the length of the growing season. Oranges, we started last August, we'll finish in July. Because those are trees where the leaves just keep going. Potatoes, it might be three months. It's really gonna be crop dependent, but our solution is of no use until we have that data, because that's what really gives us that optimal zone, and then it's also the data that feeds this algorithm that tells us just how well the crop is behaving from a transpiration point. And just a quick one, if I can. So path to market, hardware, software is often tricky. Um, how are you doing that at the moment? Is it sort of boots on the ground, speaking to growers one by one? Is it something you're doing more scalably? There's a few different ways of doing it. We've had some great success at conferences. We were at the Wine Tech Conference last year, and for the money we put into the booth, we got like a five or six level of return on that money just in sales. And it was talking to people, getting them, getting their head around, looking at the output of the plant, not just soil moisture and weather and the inputs and things like that. The other piece is active discussions with industry associations and water management boards. So I've had some great conversations with the Almond Board of, of Australia, with Citrus SA. We've been working with Wine Australia. I have regular conversations with various wine, wine grape growing regions around Australia. To get into the California market, that's exactly what we'll be doing also, is approaching Western growers in the Central Valley as a great big association and talking to them, presenting to them our solutions to say, can we work with you to take this to your members? And if you can stand behind us and say, this sounds reasonable, your members will be willing to buy into it a little bit more. Great. 
Thanks, Liz. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Athena IR Tech. And now I'd like to introduce Tata Technologies, which I hope I pronounced correctly. So my name is Sidney Mazi. We are Tato, a people management software. We work with fish culture and horticulture. And we work with growers, contractors, and labor hire companies in this sector. So just to have an idea from a customer perspective, how important this, this is, up to 50% of the variable costs is people, and this being managed by pen and paper. And there's a big squeeze in the market, as you well know, from the market pressure, also from the regulatory pressure. From the market pressure, you can see inputs and labor costs going up to the hill, like as high as possible. And also in, in case of labor, labor, sometimes you can even find labor. And that's a challenge in the industry. And in terms of the regulatory pressure, employment requirements and immigration rules are getting tighter and tighter. So there's a big squeeze in the market. If you look the problem deeper a bit, the problem starts with a lack of transparency from the employee to uh, employer to employee. If there's no transparency of or like what I'm doing in the field, I, I don't trust my employee, there's no trust because, and then there's no motivation. If there's no motivation, there's no performance, if no performance, uh, not paying them well. So there's a high turnover. This is, and this, what we call the productivity drain keeps happening over and over again. On top of this, there's the regulatory pressure. So you can see more and more rules to, in this market. So what's the secret to solve this? We have a specific design app that, uh, that will make employers, employers and employees happier. But it's not that simple. That's why people often fail to, to do this. And there's a few steps you need to follow to do this right. It needs to be to have a very intuitive uh, app that the worker sees and want to use from day one. Uh, you have to have very accurate data. You need to be transparent with this. There's no problems in terms of payroll and then build trust. Once you build trust, and then you only then you start tracking and rewarding performance. Uh, with once you do this, your performance will change completely. It's much more. Uh, you you see workers making more money happier, they stay longer, so it's easier. And you, as an employer, it's uh, become uh, better, it's easier to hire because uh, you become a more attractive employer. So easier to hire, easier to retain, and much less uh, training uh, required. And as a collateral effect, all of this, you collect collecting the right, right data in the field, in the orchards or vineyards, you have the data to, to, compliance, to comply. But if you try to comply first, it doesn't work. It needs to be a collateral effect of all of this. The employee needs to be making more money as in his mind. And also all this data that you generate helps you better plan the next season. And the secret number two is that there's, there's like vineyard management solutions that understand a lot about wine, but not necessarily about people. There's payroll providers, very good in taxes and like paying employees. But understanding the operational excellence that you need for the employee in the middle, very few or, or none of them really understand. We don't believe this is uh, which such a high cost. We don't believe this is something to be handled as an add-on module. It needs to be a fo uh, your focus. So our solution is a people-centric uh, software that just focus on this. And the key difference between us and what we have in the market is that they are extra work because when you when you, you work all day, at the end of the day, you report what you've done. Why with our tool, we are operational excellence tool. We help the worker make better decisions and make more money throughout the day. So we are extra help. And so what is that? We are a specifically designed people-centric app, very focused on productivity, on boosting productivity of the workforce. One thing that we often hear when we talk to customers uh, is that, oh, thank God this exists. I can see other presentations here that talk about uh, new ways. Uh, you can see, you can improve uh, inputs, but it's very few people are thinking of the labor. And this is such a, uh, uh, when you talk to the, the grower, he's crying for this kind of, his have uh, need this to, to solve part of his problems. And we always say that our tool is kind of free. 
because we aim to improve your uh, productivity of your workforce in five, 10, 20%. We have customers saying that uh, the, the workforce was 50% more productive. And if we just make you 0.2% more productive, we are free. So you can see the power of this tool. And I've been around for six years. We grew 16 fold in the past 30 months. Uh, we track more than 10 million hours in our platform. Uh, we are, and we are assessed business model with recurring revenue. And a little bit more about like, we work with global brands like Constellation Brands and, and uh, huge companies. We work from 30 people to up to 3000 people that each customer has. And that's, that's it for me. Sorry about the problems at the beginning. I hope I compensate for this. Uh, cool. Thanks, Sydney and Amy, and congratulations on already being at revenue and, and kind of growing from there. Um, I, there was a bunch of questions, really. The, I mean, what, le what, what lessons and changes have you made to the UX UI in, in response to customer feedback? Oh, we... Um yeah. yeah, I would say that there's not really, It's it's been part of our, our product from day one. Um, we were out in the field co-designing from day one. Um, so everything is as, as simple as possible, as fewer taps, no typing, all of that sort of thing taken into account. Okay, it's uh, Ron here. Uh, just a, a question sort of out of the blue. Uh, for the future, um, is there any uh, perhaps thoughts around using the app to actually assist in a little bit more HR and record keeping uh, for particular staff so they could do perhaps on-site training via the app uh, for work health and safety uh, regulations and keep those records perhaps by the work, uh, each worker? Yeah, we, uh, we believe for the foreseeable future, uh, future, we need to be focused just because we, we have a, uh, there's, a, there's a need for this problem uh, that needs solving and everybody that's trying to do everything has, has failed to, to solve. But yes, there's opportunities in all, uh, also from, from recruiting, HR, uh, health and safety, and any in, in helping them finding workers, everything in this will become a much bigger tool. There's a lot of opportunities. We just try to be our, our in the last 30 months, we try to be laser focused and that's what we took us to a whole new level. And yes, we are uh, planning to open new, new revenue streams later. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. No worries. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Andrew Kersley, and I'm the CEO of Smart Machine. Uh, at Smart Machine, we build robots and we provide data insights that are the future of efficient, safe, and sustainable vineyards and orchards. Uh, the problems that we're trying to address, uh, you know, it's the availability, it's the cost, and it's the quality of labour. It's a global issue, and it's relevant to all growers. The way we approach this problem is we use technology to change how we use that labour resource, um, you know, all the resources we have available. We improve operational efficiencies of the machinery in this space uh, through better design and through application of technology. And we use the technology to enable sustainability step changes for these growers as they move forward into the future. So I'd like to introduce you to Oxen, which is our flagship product. Um, this is the world's first fully autonomous, multitasking robotic vineyard vehicle. So one of these machines can be, well, sorry, lots of these machines can be managed by a single operator. Um, each of these machines can undertake multiple functions with each row pass in combinations that you can't even do with a tractor. They've got advanced sensors and software for real-time navigation, for precise positioning of implements, um, and in particular for safety, so for stopping for people and objects that are in an orchard and in vineyard. They're precise, um, and we have implement feedback. So, you know, one of the most important things about autonomy is knowing when the machine is doing the right job and able to stop and warn operators when it's not. Um, they're efficient, 
So, you know, no bathroom breaks, no toilet breaks, no lunch times. Um, they just keep running, they stay in the field 24-7. Uh, and then we capture a huge amount of data and pass that through to operators in real time. So why would growers sort of transition to this? Um, you know, other than all of those benefits, it's a real step change in the value proposition. So significantly reducing fleet sizes um, by up to sort of, you know, two thirds, reducing it by a third. Um, significantly cutting back the, the amount of resource to operate that machinery, um, again, down to about a third of that size. So it's a huge savings for growers and a massive increase to their bottom line, potentially 33% um, in some growing environments. This is a, a real life vineyard in New Zealand. Uh, Perno Ricard winemakers um, have backed us from the outset. So they've been our development partner through the last four years. Um, we've built three generations of machine for them. They're now a cornerstone investor in the business. That's how much they believe in it and have ordered 19 machines to date. They're also part of our transition into Australia um, alongside Duxton Group and Fable Group, who are uh, you know, a cornerstone development partner for the Australian market. In terms of global opportunity, we've got four markets that we're targeting, New Zealand, Australia, US and Europe. Um, we see that as being a two to $3 billion opportunity with about two thirds of that made up of annual machinery and implement sales, um, and then another third, which is annual reoccurring revenue around service and support agreements, um, as well as subscription models for the software. Um, and we see that piece growing fairly significantly into the future as growers start seeing actionable data and insights um, that they can use. In terms of what that looks like for our business, um, I'll just point out these are New Zealand financial years, so March to March. Uh, we're sitting in the middle of the 23-24 right now. Uh, so 24, 25 for us is about cementing the revenue model in New Zealand and growing into these other international markets. So starting to demonstrate machinery in growers' backyards. Um, and then 26, 27 is, is, is about growth. Uh, so New Zealand and Australia, we're going to look to target from our base here in New Zealand, set up some infrastructure in Australia. But the US and Europe is very much around who the o, global OEM to help us um, scale into the US and European markets is. We're having a lot of those conversations at the moment. Um, and the revenue potential is huge depending on, you know, who that party is and what their appetite for uh, for growth looks like. Our current investment proposition, we're just raising a seed round of $2 million. Um, it's effectively fully subscribed at the moment, for the, but for the right investor, we look for oversubscription now. Uh, we've got some pretty, uh, some pretty standard, um, the milestones we're trying to achieve with this raise, it's around, you know, developing that revenue base in New Zealand, um, global expansion into Australia and the US over the next 18 months, uh, building our team around us, so developing the people we have further than what we already do, um, continued product development on the on the machines themselves, especially for those global markets. Um, and now that we're on to, our, I guess, our commercialize, commercializable vehicle, it's around the IP strategy we put in place to protect what we've built. Um, and then that big one in the middle is the strategic partnership. So you know, who, who are the channel partners who can support us with global manufacturing, um, with customer service and support in some of those international markets. And again, some really promising um, conversations on that front already. We've got a really comprehensive team um, that I'm really proud of. We've organically grown to 24 people across the board. That's software, electronics, hardware. We've got vineyard managers. Um, we've got people who have built orchard machinery their whole lives. Um, it's a really comprehensive uh, multidisciplinary team. And again, this is something that's a significant value to the OEMs that we're talking with. Um, you know, as, as uh, technology in general progresses in the horticultural space, having a team like this in the Southern Hemisphere is super valuable. Thank you very much. Any questions? Hi, Andrew. Great pitch. I'm um, not going to lie, I kind of want one of those things, but that's besides the point. Um, so quick question for you. you know, what's the cost to entry compared to traditional equipment, and is this equipment accessible to smaller operators, or is it just really targeted at the, the big operators that can you know, theoretically afford it? Yeah, gr uh, great question. Um, at the moment, it's a premium price point on traditional tractors and implements, but I think when built into an operational cost model, as I've shown, there's significant savings. So, um, you know, assuming it ties in with people's replacement cycles for machinery and equipment, it's, it works really well right now. So um, for that reason, we're targeting big commercial growers who have, um, you know, large 
hectares of ownership models uh, where this makes sense right now. But I think moving forward, um, there's also a huge opportunity for your smaller vineyard owners when you consider, you know, having a machine that's capable of doing all of the track the tasks in that space, freeing up your time to, you know, to pursue other activities. You know, similar, I think there's also like a shared cost model. Um, you know, Europe's got a much smaller ownership model where, um, you know, that sort of uh, communal ownership of machinery and, you know, farming blocks of land in bigger chunks um, starts to be more attractive. Andrew, uh, I mean, you would know about Swarm Farm here in Australia. Um, so is your autonomous vehicle specific for viticulture and do you intend to manufacture not just the autonomous platform but all of the implements as well? And do you have yep, a – yeah, sorry. No, no, that's what – yeah, I, I mean, we, we've focused specifically on viticulture as a – you know, that's what Oxen is, is the flagship product for viticulture. Um, robotics is very hard to do at a production scale. So I think when you start looking at the production pressures that lots of these um, commercial vineyards have, you know, to be able to operate 24 hours a day, um, to get 80, 90% efficiencies out of machinery, to have them robust and reliable for years is a very unique challenge. So um, – but what we have built is a whole lot of building blocks that we can now, um, you know, change to suit different growing environments. So we'll scale viticulture globally and then we'll look at what other crops. And it might not be the same platform, the same machine that enables us to, to do that. But the underlying pieces of technology are. Um, to follow on with your second point, the implements. Um, to date, we've built all of our own implements just because that feedback loop is so important. But we now have the technology that we could retrofit or bolt on to um, existing implements or tie in with existing implement manufacturers and actually close that loop. So um, autonomy is more about knowing that the job you're doing is right and knowing when to stop machinery when it's not. Um, and so this is a you know it's a pretty unique point of difference that um, we've got a you know a fully closed loop system um, and can integrate that with existing implements, um, whether they be second hand or new. So. Um, so thank you very much, Andrew from Oxen. I'd now like to introduce uh, Roubaix Wines and Avron, who's here in person. A new way to find your perfect wine match. Hi, I'm Avron Rubin, the founder of Roubaix Wines, and our focus is the $65 billion US and Australian wine industry, and specifically the struggles to connect with the curious wine explorer, as traditional marketing efforts are proven ineffective. The Curious Wine Explorers represent a $4.2 billion opportunity in the direct-to-consumer channel alone. Our solution is an at-home wine tasting experience that brings the joy of discovery into your own environment. It's a highly personalized product. It's in your home, at your pace, at your time, at your order, and specifically wines chosen to match your tastes. Our product that provides a solution is called Give It A Swill, and it consists of three components. The first component is the wine matching AI, which makes sure that the right wine goes to the right person. The second component is the small format 187ml glass bottles, which make sure that our product is affordable and accessible. The third element, well, sorry, gone too far. The third element is our UX interface, which uh, deploys a personalized sommelier experience and also captures the data during the fee uh, feedback during your tasting. Together, the technology, the content, and the small format wine bottles creates a safe, social, and fun wine tasting experience. Why us, why now? There is a significant market opportunity, and we have a product that is complete, that's also showing uh, product market fit. We have more than 1,000 warm leads, we have our production facilities in place and distribution tested. We have raw materials. We have our advertising and marketing plan sorted. We have an experienced team and we're really ready to go. Our main revenue streams comes from the subscriptions of the wine tasting packs, together with the personalized offers, which are linked to the person's feedback and scores from the tasting. Some of the numbers. Our service obtainable market is 87.5 million. Our lifetime value over the cost to acquire a client is 15-fold, 
and our financial model shows us breaking even in January 2024 with a return on equity of 17 times over the next five years. Our journey, our first 30 years was all about, 30 years, first 30 months, was all about our MVP. And during this phase, we built our own production content studio and our proprietary tech platform. Despite um, meticulous planning, we did come across obstacles, including not being able to find third-party suppliers that could manufacture the bottles at the quality and cost uh, that were required to make this a success. So our response to this was to build our own in-house fully automated bottling line, which whilst a big undertaking, it does serve as a barrier to future competitors in both time and cost. We also see this as an actual positive and a point of difference because we have better control of the quality of our product from start to finish. Currently, we are focusing on our brand, our product market fit, and um, yeah, and some of the highlights of this has been signing up over a thousand people in our trials and a branding project and a go-to-market strategy. Where we are at the moment is we're raising these seed funds so that we can move into the future phase of expanding rapidly and scaling up and concentrating on acquiring new clients and working on our retention. Two of the key things that during this future phase would be a $900,000 marketing campaign and also the first of our mobile bottling plants, which allows us to easily replicate and quickly scale. Some of the traction that we had during the trial period, we had more than 1,000 people sign up at a cost to acquire less than $2 a person, which sort of signifies that there's a lot of interest in our product. Additionally, we got more than 30 data points from each of these people, which allowed us to get insights and to validate our audience. It also gave us a chance to test our production and our distribution and to make incremental improvements to our product. We found that the media also was quite responsive and got a lot of coverage during our trial periods as well. Our team comprises of three entrepreneurial co-founders, each from a very different background. But when placed together, we cover operations and finance, human resources and marketing. We've also got a great team of, ad of advisors, including Ben, who's the ex-GM of the largest wine club in Australia, and Lynn, who's the ex-VP of marketing for the second largest wine company in the USA. For this particular round, we're seeking a million dollars, with 80% of that gain towards sales and marketing to really drive the product forward, and 20% um, for plant and equipment. This goes on top of our previous raises and grants that we've already received. We're really excited about this $4.2 billion opportunity to help the wine industry connect with the curious wine explorers and are looking for investors who, who want to join us on this journey. If you're a seed stage investor, love wine, and or a potential 17 return on your investment, let's chat. Cheers. I'll ask a quick one. Um, the, this is obviously focused more on an educational experience for the wine lover who wants to understand a bit more about the wine that they're tasting. Where do you get the wine from that you provide to the people who've signed up? Uh, so the two parts of the question. So the, thank you, Firstly, um, The first part of the question, it's more than just an educational experience. It's more about the, the experience itself. Um, because you know people want to be a little bit more wine literate, so it's actually got a broad appeal. I think it's more appealing if you think of someone going into Dan Murphy's and you've seen a wall of wine, and anyone who just stands there and goes, I wonder which wine I should get versus I'm just buying on price or I'm only buying that because my friend drop. It's a huge part of the market that just wants that little bit of education that feels the way wine's done at the moment. It's not really, it's very excluding and people don't feel part of it, and that's what this is meant to, make them feel wine comfortable. Uh, the second part it, on which wines do we use, that's a combination of buying wines ourselves from bulk and also working on behalf of wineries. So let's say, for example, we were doing a pack for Jacobs Creek. We could have four Jacobs Creek um, wines in there. What makes it quite special is that we actually drive the sale back to the full product. This is just a tasting pack. So um, very different to other wine clubs where what you're subscribing to is getting your full wine for the month. We're just sending you a taster. We're making sure that you really like that wine that you tried before you buy. Then we make the offer on what you already like. Uh, thanks. Again, I've got lots of questions. Um, I mean, after you've, you've, you've bought the bottle from the supplier, from the, from the grower, and you've taken it to your plant and rebottled it, 
and and then I'm subscribed to it and all the infrastructure that goes along with that. Why can't I just get four full bottles of wine? Why can't you? Wouldn't it be cost competitive just to get four full bottles of wine? So as a tasting experience, if you wanted to have a tasting experience, that pack for $35 gives you a range of wines to taste and to experience and to taste side by side versus you're going to buy four bottles at $30 each. If it doesn't become affordable, this is a mass market product. Um, and the other one was, um, you talked about a 17x return for the receipt investor. So what is your exit strategy? Uh, the exit strategy is for us to become a tech company. Uh, a very, very big part of what we do is actually our AI. Uh, this, what you see, is part of what we call a business journey or commercialising our data collection while our AI has been trained. We see the, the type of AI that we need to, that we develop in and train in, that we need about half a million taste, to, uh, taste tests to be completed. Once that is in place, we see the ability to sell off the production and the marketing arms and actually license and have rights to the data and actually use that technology, which has a much higher return, uh, broader in the industry. So the buyer? Who's the buyer? Uh, it, well, in two different markets. So we, we don't believe that the Australian and the US will be the same buyers. Uh, in the US, we have been meeting with um, the ex-CMO um, for Constellation, the ex-VP for Gallo, the ex-VP for Wine Group, and all of them are saying that the companies in the US, whether it's Wenties or Neils and stuff, which are focusing on their direct-to-consumer, would love this, those that have multiple brands. Makes a lot of sense for them to buy us out. Just one quick one, uh, Avron, thank you. Um, what's the expected shelf life in supply chain once you've finished packaging? Um, I'm glad you asked that. Thanks, Ron. Um, I, I think Ron himself has said, you know, having a, a bottling plant doesn't mean you can bottle wine. Uh, we spent um, almost more than the plant just in the lab equipment and stuff to try and make sure that we were doing things correctly, looking at the different techniques, um, processes and stuff like that. Our objective when we bottled this was to make sure that it mimics the full bottle of wine that it represents. So if a full bottle of wine with the permeability and you're looking at all the closures and stuff like that, that's going to give you a very similar shelf life because it's meant to represent the wine that's in the full bottle. Thank you very much, Avron. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Sir Tiff ID Technologies, and uh, Robert will be joining us virtually. Statistically, one in ten people in, your, in the room right now have consumed fake wine. But how do you know it wasn't you? Wine fraud is a huge global issue. We're seeing 8.1% of direct direct sales wine being fraudulent. That is having a huge impact on wineries with a revenue leakage of up to 6.6% a year. To combat this, Track and Trace Solutions, the Track and Trace Solutions market has had a market growth of over 20% or nearly 20% compound annual growth rate. And we're looking at having a market size of nearly $14.3 billion by 2030. We formed Certified E to solve this problem. And our CTO, Chris, will explain our solution. This shows the briefcase system that we've developed along with our mobile app. The mobile app controls the equipment in either collecting scans at wineries or verifying an unknown product. The briefcase has three components inside. <clears throat> On the right-hand side of the briefcase is the light source. Then you can see the bottle that contains the wine. And then there's the receiver here, the detector, that detects the infrared transmitted through the bottle. By subtraction, we work out the light absorbed from the spectrum, the fingerprint, if you will. And our software, which is in the Google Cloud, manages all of this. Next slide, please. Now we're transferring this technology to the beginning of the supply chain. Attaching it to the bottling line and working with the major bottling line manufacturers such as MBF and Bertolassi, among others. As an allied supplier to them, to the bottling line manufacturers, we work with their engineering teams to integrate and retrofit their systems. A key component here is that it enables faster, more accurate ground truth data capture 
at scale. We sell this solution to the estate bottlers who meet the following criteria. Firstly, they have an export license. Secondly, they're fast adopters of new technology. Thirdly, they're selling medium to high value wine. And fourthly, they own their own bottling line. The customers for the authentication component, however, are two, two areas, the regulators and revenue collection agencies in each country. Because of fraud, they're not collecting the excise and duties and tax associated with the alcohol that's usually contained in these wines. So they attract higher tax and duty recovery through the increased volume of surveillance that's enabled through a cheaper, faster, non-destructive testing environment and capability. They're also able to improve on the food security surveillance that they undertake. But the major customers will be in trade. So the, <clears throat> the Audis of the world, the uh, Marks and Spencers, et cetera, that to meet their ESG obligations and food security obligations will want to take on the authentication step that we have with, uh, with the briefcase. Next slide, please. So in summary, there are five key attributes of our solution. Verification is based on the product inside the bottle, not the packaging. It is smartphone and cloud enabled, uh, able to be delivered anywhere in the world. You get results in seconds without opening the bottle. And obviously it's highly scalable. But more strategically, by attaching to the bottling lines, it blocks competition. You wouldn't install two. And systematically increases the world's largest database of wine signatures ready for leveraging with AI. So founded in 2021, off the back of my university research, the company started building the expertise to, be, to bring a real chemical authentication system to the market. Since then, we have built our first scanning prototype, as you saw earlier, and are rapidly progressing through our technology readiness level four and five as we speak. The IP development has been identified and provisional patents are expected by June 30. Some of the most motivating aspects of, develop, of, of our development have been our engagement with the wine industry, visiting wineries to fingerprint their wines, collaborating with one of the French first grow wineries uh, to bring this to market and being accepted into the Google startup program. Benefiting from our inherent scalability, we are looking at spending 1.5 million over the next two years, to in, uh, in two, in, over the next two financial years, in hardware and software development of our service to take us through to our, our first customer and onwards to a sustainable business by 2025. We are currently in a live funding round, raising pre-seed capital of $350,000. That is to bring us up to our seed round within the next two to uh, six to 12 months, where we'll be raising 12, uh, 2 million. To date, we've been able to bring together a highly experienced board. We've got Stuart Tom, Tom Arnott, who is a very exp highly experienced entrepreneur and has had multiple exits from startups. Stuart Davies, who has connections like you wouldn't believe through the agricultural industry and has linked us up with one of the largest, the largest wine show in the Southern Hemisphere to, to, to fingerprint their wines. And Michelle Anderson, who has got 30 years plus experience in the wine industry and a master of wine. So I'll leave you with four points. We are special because we, unlike our competitors, we chemically authenticate wine on the supply chain in seconds without opening the bottle. If you see what we see in this business and you want to be part of it, please get in touch. Thank you. Thanks for that. I, my quick question before I pass it over is, um, so my verification when I've got a bottle of wine in my hand is just looking at your certificate or am I using my smartphone to use its infrared capability to get the same fingerprint? Mm -hmm. uh, no, sorry, if, Robert, I'll take that question if you like. Go for it. Um, no, this isn't a, a B2C type play. So our target customers, if you recall, were the tr was in trade so it's the auction houses if they want to authenticate their wines. It's the, um, the Aldis that are purchasing wines that, and you know, Yellowtail has had some, some fraudulent problems in the, in the UK, so Tesco and those sorts of places as well. So it's at that scale. 
So the fraud occurs either at the, at the high volume, low value end or at the high value, low volume. And so we're targeting those two. It's not really for you, the consumer. My quick question is, does the chemical fingerprint of a wine change over time? Or is it um, static? And if so, if it does change, how do you adjust for that? Uh, so the answer is yes, it does change over time. The degree of change we're still working through. Uh, but this is the initial entry into the market is on the current vintages. So we're not looking to go back and test you know, the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s wines at this point. It is about the, the vintages that are coming out now, so the 2018, 1920s, and as it's going through the bottling lines. So, <clears throat> so yes, if there is a, 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 an annual change, if you will, uh, we'll have to manage that. But we're taking into account the metadata attached to each scan. So the temperature that it's scanned at in the, in the bottling plant Typically, standard temperature and pressure, 25 degrees, et cetera. Um, we know that it varies when it's out in the field. But our machine learning in the cloud will be able to take account of that. All right, uh, just another quick question for me. Um, my ability to tell wine is I can tell if it's good wine or bad wine or vinegar. That's about it. Yeah. So <laughs> does this kind of, do you have to get the fingerprint at each to be able to tell it's the same? Like, are you just, are you trying to say it's, hey, it's the exact same thing that went into that bottle or... Are you just saying that, hey, it is, you know, close or like, you know, mm. how, what's the sensitivity? Like, can I tell the vintage? Can I tell, you know, that sort of thing? You, you've hit the nail on the head. That's where we want to end up. Okay. That was where we started with this is can we use AI to predict vintage, variety and region? Um, you need a lot of data to yeah. be able to do that. And the issue that we found was that at 60 bottles an hour, which is what we were doing, scanning by hand, that's not fast enough. So we have to get onto the bottling lines. The strategic imperative for that is to knock out the competition, because as we said, you wouldn't do two. But you're right, that's where we want to get to. But you know, there's 1,800, sorry, 1,182 exporters in Australia. They're the ones that we want to pursue first. Um, and once we start to build the data set, that's when we can start to apply AI. The technology we're using at the moment is not able to discern down to the level of 75 parts per million or 150 parts per million the sort of vinegar type changes that you see with oxidized wine. And that's what you need to be able to detect there. But we're researching those other features to see if we can incorporate those on the bottling line and in the field. That's the challenge. It's got to be portable in the field, but also able to be attached to the bottling line. Fantastic, Robert, well done. Thanks, Thanks, much. Much. Thanks Robert and Chris. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce Vino X online. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Michi. I'm the founder of Vino X. I'm excited to introduce Vino X with co founder Simon. Uh, Vino X is a fine wine platform that solves the major problems associated with investing in wine. Investing in wine can be a solid and profitable investment choice. More people would do it except these problems poor liquidity, complex storage, and commissions. We are making wine investment accessible. It's a new era of accessibility and people could invest in wine with minimum investment of $1. We solve the authentication with mandatory fraud check and blockchain based authentication. We connect over 700 merchants globally. We only use top rated warehouse worldwide and we manage by ourselves. In the end, the low commission and fractional bottle investment for as low as $1 for the users. At Vino X, we have managed or partnered with third party storage providers worldwide to ensure optimal storage conditions for wines. This allows us to provide our users with access to wine from uh, wine merchants 
private collectors and wineries through the BT or Vino X platform. Whether you prefer to purchase wine using fiat or cryptocurrency, we offer flexibility in payment options. Users can choose to have the wine sent directly to their homes to enjoy or to mint their own wines as NFTs which can then be used in Web3 decentralized apps, such as our Web3 game and wine DAO. Don't need that. Yeah, Simon gonna talk. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, sure, sorry. Uh, as as second best investment portfolio over the last 20 years, along with lower uh, volatility, uh, than gold. Investing in fine wine can offer better risk adjusted return than a traditional portfolio. In the meantime, we know access potential in the Web3 NFT market, which reached a record uh, 25 billion in volume in 20, 2021. Along with emerge, emerging economics, uh, presents a larger present. Uh, potential growth for the Vino X platform. Vino X manages and work with partners uh, with bonded warehouses worldwide to provide optimal storage and deferred duty and bet for cost saving in trading and storage. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk about next about these web series pages. Um, in an effort of the attraction a young generation, VinoX has developed a Web3 lend-to-end game that provides utility for wine NFTs in the ecosystem and potentially for earning for the, the game players. Sorry. And the wine NFT will serve as a foundation of the wine DAO allow users to exchange the NFTs for LP tokens and participating in the investment decisions, uh, benefiting from those appreciation of the wines they invested in the, uh, by the wine DAO. Um, this actually giving user potential access for wine investment as low as $1. And here's some uh, traction we're having uh, for our first week's launch for the one game. In the first week's uh, Venex game, which is the VT Diary uh, marketing campaign, was achieved 3,000 plus trader follower, 2,000 attendants at our launch talk with uh, MW Fuel Friedman, and 1,800 sign ups for the game's close beta. And in terms of the the, the revenue for this uh, uh, Vino X platform, we're charging $5 per cases per month for storage and service fees in our inbound warehouse, as well as 5% uh, commissions for buy and sell transactions on our platform. Additionally, there are, there are also some micro transactions such as NFT issuance and also the in apps sales in the uh, VT Diary game. Uh, like mystery box on uh, our Web3 components. And Venex X is targeting 30,000 users in the first year um, with a project revenue for 51 million uh, revenue and almost $3 million profit. We hope it can be double the numbers in the following years. Uh, there's some roadmap for our project, we have completed the first stage of development on Venex trading platform and uh, set a launch beta version for our Venex game in this month. And we plan officially launch the game in May and followed by the wind down and the warehouse building in June. So by 2024, we aim to establish a global ecosystem for our user. And here's some uh, short description for our teams and uh, our ex experienced teams with expertise cover most of area of the wine and Web3 industry. 
And Vinox is currently raising a seed round for $2 million US dollar at $20 million valuation, which all funds will be allocated to for, uh, for future development and marketing strategy. We are offer 10% equity for project with equivalent token to be just distributed to the later. Uh, thanks for watching and just free to try out our website, which is the vinox.io. Uh, everything is able to using and try. Just let us know if there's any uh, suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Ron? Uh, yeah, I've got uh, one quick question. Uh, just on your... Oops. Yes. No sound. Hello? Uh, thank you. No sound. Sorry, you think an electrician would know how to turn a microphone on. Um, uh, just one quick question. Just on your storage fees, uh, your $5 uh, uh, per case per month, is that based on a half a dozen or a dozen... It's a per unit, so so in the in the warehouse, normally the the users storage for uh, six bottles cases or twelve bottle cases, but it's, there's no difference for from the fee perspective because we're all counting this as a unit in the storage when we because we allocate this certain place for the user. So actually, the price is the same even you put twelve bottles. So it's actually more value if you put to, to our bottle a case in the storage. Uh, congratulations to an ambitious kind of project with lots of moving parts. I mean, the, to get to your 300 million revenue in three years, how many cases of wine, premium wine is that, that you're going to be purchasing on behalf of customers? Because uh, we are actually, we uh, the the projection of this is not only the purchasing but also the transaction between the wines so so we actually calculate this based on the user uh, on our platform and because the average purchase for fine wine is 1000 to 3000 US dollar per, per transaction and uh, we are counting this as a member uh, population so we are we are combined the user of to trading the fine wine as a wine collector, but also combined with those NFT player who who usually trading on the Web3 area. So we're actually looking for uh, like 30,000 user which are trading our our platform for the search of the profit. And do you do you dictate when the whether the, the sale of those assets is made, or is that based? Is, does the owner advise? Does the all user advise you when to sell the units that are in storage? Uh, we actually have a system to linking uh, the sales and trading because uh, in the trading parts we have an API with those merchants, so uh, you actually can listing and uh, selling in the order book by itself. So we so we actually this is all automatic uh, actions in the back. So what you have to do is just purchasing the wine. The wine will be in your storage, and when you sell the wines, you just listing like uh like like in the share market to trading with others. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Thank you very much. And um, that was an unexpected situation. So well done for working on the fly. Um, so now we're just going to um, just wait a couple minutes while we get the computer set up. And then we'll hand over to um, Bricks and Mortar, past um, program alumni. Hi, everybody. My name is Grant Baker. I'm the founder of uh, uh, Brick and Mortar, uh, which is one of the companies of, as part of the VSA group. <laughs> Effectively, we're an organization that has two divisions to it. One is our fully sustained and managed brick and mortar digital agency as a full service business. And the second portion is um, our SaaS business, Mortar AI, which was launched in October last year as a direct uh, SaaS piece and as an enterprise SaaS solution in uh, February this year. What are we trying to do? We're trying to deal with two primary issues. 
two burning platforms. One, we understood that in 2020, the world was about to change with the way data was going to be utilized by companies um, and how companies would need to use data to actually maximize their returns. And two, that as this change came through, companies would be looking for an integrated solution that did an end-to-end -end, uh, uh, outcome for them. Mortar AI and brick and mortar is exactly this. It is the only all-in-one transformational platform that allows you to turn your data mess into a miracle. It um, allows you to uh, make sure that data is your source of truth. And that's a fundamental shift that we see in digital marketing and marketing moving forward over the last three years. And, and by far the biggest era of growth in this marketplace, about in the last three years, around $7.5 billion globally. It is an integrated solution, which is what one of the biggest challenges are. The number of companies out there that are using multiple solutions that are across many systems can't bring that data together. The data is fractured. Um, there are large systems that will stop companies from maximizing that value. In a recent Gartner article, they talk about 53% of companies being able to use that data. And most importantly, we hyper-personalize everything. Nothing is left to chance. <coughs> How do we do that? We do that by bringing together our three core platforms, our customer data platform, which has been custom built over the last three years, um, which we see as groundbreaking, our marketing automation platform, which is fully integrated and is an enterprise-grade solution, and then finally, our digital uh, media piece, which is not simply uh, into Facebook and Meta, but a full integration into trade desks with uh, technologies that allow us to bring first-party data directly into those solutions. Why? What's the reason? The outcome is simple. What we do is we offer complete transformational value to our customers, be that at the fact that we can do non-tech integrations at about 90% about saving, knowing that we deliver about a 62% increase in return on ROI, and knowing that we reduce the cost of marketing by around 40%. I'm not going to run through all these slides like this, but it's simply just to say in the three years that we've been going, there are a few milestones that are worth mentioning. In our first year, when we did our first pitch at Ferment, we did $9,000 that year. And this is a, not the financial year, it's an annual year. Year two, a little bit better, we sat at about $400,000. Our third financial year, uh, year at about $800,000. And as we currently sit, we are sitting on a uh, projected revenue of around $2.7 million. This is not something we're planning on doing. We are doing. We have a substantial client base that delivers that. Where we're moving to right now is how we go to market. And that is a multi-channel approach. We have just completed our integrations into a zero commercial marketplace, which gives us access into the US in partnership with Microsoft. Um, and our route over the next six to 12 months is that US penetration of those markets. Financially, it's been a really positive outcome. Um, we've invested over $3 million to date. Um, we are sitting, as we sit today, at an annualized revenue of $1.6 million. We have shown for the last four quarters, a 27% quarter-on-quarter growth, which is why we see 100% increase in revenue each year. Current valuation is around $12 million, and that is based not on what we did three years ago, but on a multiple of six and the horrible economics that we find ourselves in now um, and with, a, with a revenue multiple of, of six to eight. So what are we after? Very simply, we're in a position right now where we um, are not trying to raise money to build something or to deliver something, but quite simply to get into market faster and more efficient. Our platforms are complete, our technology is complete, our systems that take us to market are complete, and our mission over the next three months, and we are on track for that mission, is to be uh, at a uh, break-even point in terms of cash flow. Our burn rate will be gone by June, which for a three-year-old startup we think is quite unique, but it's our growth rate which is driving us. That's stepping into the US, that's stepping into our SaaS models, and that's stepping that allows us that scalability that we're looking for as a business. As a team, we are geared and structured for it. We have a fantastic combination of skilled marketers, of, of strategists, and some fairly experienced businessmen that help guide us through our process. Brick and mortar, and mortar is a solution that has been tested in the market over the last three years and is here today simply to ensure that we actually have funding to, to deliver the, 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 uh, our, our, our go-to-market strategy. Thank you. Um, well done on the progress so far. Thank you. Uh, so with your expansion, 
obviously you're selling into some wine customers, I suspect. We are. Um, but do you have a particular uh, vertical focus or an industry sector focus? Because selling to everyone is really tricky. It's, so could you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, because we use data as the source of truth, we aren't defined by the traditional categories that, that marketers or research houses have used. We use that first party data to actually build the segments that we go into. We've, we are heavily invested in wine. We work with about 15 wineries uh, across almost 20 across uh, Australia. But at the same time, we, we operate across financial services, through B2B, uh, through retailers, uh, uh, an enormous array. And we can do that because we're not trying to define ourselves by the, by the category and what the market perception of the category has been, but rather the first party data that exists for that category, much like a sales force. Um, who's our direct competitor moving forward into the US, um, can operate across multiple categories. And so we have the, the power and the ability to do exactly the same. Um, yes, you've clearly got a really keen eye for the numbers and the metrics in your business, which is a, probably a lesson for everyone, all the other people that are pitching and building their businesses. Um, I mean, what else has gone right for you to grow as quickly as you have? It's a great question. <laughs> I think um, it's, it's been the ability to pivot um, and to be uh, responsive to the market. Two years ago, our mission was to actually take brick and mortar and expand that globally. And when the market switched, um, we saw revenues dry up. We saw the change happening in the, in the financial and tech markets. We had the capability to, to, to switch our business to say, um, we need to focus on our SaaS. We need to focus on a model that gave us uh, a route, the, the most cost-effective route to market being that partner um, uh, reseller program with Microsoft. But the other key thing is, is having mentors like Jerry Adams, like Peter Siebels, Josh, uh, Jeff Rosheim, as part of our team to actually guide us. Um, people that have had knowledge and the experience and can turn around and say, Grant, you're about to do something really stupid. Don't do that. Cool. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Bricks and Mortar. And now our second program alumni, I'd like to introduce Circular Farms. So good afternoon, everyone. I am Vijish, uh, CEO of Circular Farms. We are here to introduce a solution that addresses one of the biggest challenges in farming communities. Have you ever wondered how much farm produce is wasted and it does not leave the farm. This is a significant problem that affects many farmers and communities. Studies show that up to 30 to 40 percentage of farm produce ends up in landfill, resulting in lost revenue, increased cost, and negative environmental impacts. This wastage can occur due to supply chain issues, surplus production, quality disputes, and a lot of other factors. But, it, but it's not just the produce that's being wasted. Farming activities also generate a significant amount of waste that needs to be treated to meet standards. Unfortunately, this waste is causing losses for farmers and contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. To solve this problem, we built white label circular economy platforms for farmer groups that connects farmers with a vast range of buyers and help them to reduce wastage and increase revenue. Our platforms are designed to create a sustainable and, and equitable ecosystem where all stakeholders can benefit. Our solution aims to, add, uh, aims to address this problem by providing farmers with the tools and resources they need to create a more efficient and sustainable supply chain. By connecting farmers with various buyers, and facilitating the exchange of goods and services, we can help to reduce wastage and create a more circular economy. Moreover, our platform provides real-time data and insights that help farmers to make informed decisions about their production, pricing, and logistics. This can help them optimize their operations and increase profitability while reducing environmental impacts. Through our platform, farmers will be able to connect with the various upcycling and recycling units to transform the farm produce into different food products. And moreover, farmers can donate produce to food banks, which will help them in tax savings. 
then the farmers can connect with uh, waste to energy composting farm feeds businesses uh, which will help them to process their uh, the farm wastage then farmers can get certified by the carbon credit organization to monetize their green activities and or on top of this farmers can ac get access to the technologies processes and funding developed by various CRCs working in the food waste reduction space. Our target is to reduce the farm wastage percentage to the lower buckets. As we reduce the farm wastage percentage, we can get a better return for the farmers and reduce a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. And the Circular Farms is funded by the Sustainability Victoria Department. We have got $100,000 of grant funding from Sustainability Victoria for the project implementation. As a case study, we helped a cardamom farmer groups in India to fix the challenges in aggregating their produce and finding buyers for their low quality stocks. They were operating in a small local market controlled by buyers from the local area. Our digital produce platform helped them to aggregate the produce from their member farmers, define the quality standards and connect with remote end buyers to sell their low quality and good quality products which help them to increase their gate prices and reduce operating costs. Food and Fiber Gippsland has partnered with this with us to, to implement this project in Gippsland, Victoria region. This is the production volume of Gippsland. It's a significant region, well known for its high quality agricultural produce. We have another crucial project partner, Rocket Cedar. Rocket Cedar will be helping us with business consulting and strategy. Partnership with Food, Food and Fiber Glyphs Land and Rocket Cedar helped us to find the right team to launch the project. We are all set to proceed with the launch and keep achieving our milestones. Our primary focus is on the farmer markets, farmer cooperatives, and farmer associations. Our platform can help them to unlock the potential of collaboration and build a green network to build sustainable farming practices. We have different uh, payment plans for the group based on their size and the maturity in managing operations. So we have different plans. So with respect to the, uh, the requirements, we can customize this. And this is our founder team. We are all coming from agriculture background with a strong experience in technology. Vijish myself is working as CEO and CTO. Subish is leading the operations and sales and Jenny is looking after the product delivery. We are building a green network for farmer communities. We are looking for farm groups, farm, food clusters, industry experts, and investors to join this exciting journey. That is Connect One and Circular Farms journey so far. We are looking for partners and investors to ramp up our marketing and sales operations. Please get in touch with us to learn more about our product and to connect with us. Thank you. Yeah, so I will stop sharing. Hi there. Yeah. Thanks for the uh, presentation. Um, just for clarification, so what's kind of the commercialization strategy like? So who is going to be kind of paying for that product and, and, and what do those groups look like? Yeah, so our direct customers are the, the food clusters or the farmer associations. So we will be uh, setting up the contract with them and through them like we will be reaching out to their member farmers so we got uh, two models there uh, if the group is very operational and if they are uh, well set uh, we will go for a monthly subscription model so it will be it will be ranging from like five hundred dollar to five thousand dollar depending upon the size of the network and if they are not op that operational and if they need help from help from us to run the program then we will be charging around like one percentage to two percentage, something in that range as a transaction fee. So that's how we, we operate. All right, perfect, thank you. Hi, oh, Rajesh, it's Ron here. Hello. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, with the project you've got over in Victoria uh, at the moment, how far along are you in establishing your um, end of processing network? So uh, you've obviously gaining a little bit of access to farmers. What about the other end? 
Oh, yeah. So, yeah, right now, actually, we are setting up that network, actually, like we are conducting the, the market market research and we are interviewing the people who are who could be the, the problem solver for that particular network. And we got around five of them and we are keep building it. And uh, so the launch, the project is already launched, but the platform will be launching by next month. Then. And when we launch, like, yeah, we are we are expected to have around 15 to 20 people on the other other side. And we will have around 200 farms in the, the Gippsland region. So that's how yeah, it, it's being planned. Yeah, it, yeah, it's going, progressing. Thanks, Ron. Uh, thank you. That was great. Um, yeah, two-sided market faces are tough, so congratulations on your progress. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vijesh. Um, so that completes the, uh, the, the pitches. So now the jury will go to the room next door to deliberate about the 2023 participants and choose a winner. Um, this is also your opportunity. Um, you have the chance to nominate your preferred pitch um, for our People's Choice Awards. So time to get out your phones and go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and type in foment. F-O-M-E-N-T, to cast your vote in the next five minutes. Um, and while that's happening, I would like to introduce our guest speaker for this afternoon. Um, I'd like to introduce Grant Steinberg, who is from I4 Connect. Foment is proudly supported by Oz Industry through the Entrepreneurs Program Accelerating Commercialization Service in conjunction with delivery partner I4 Connect. And I4 Connect also kindly sponsor our pitch event today. So thanks, Liz, um, and thanks everyone for your attendance today. I guess my role today is just to, um, I guess, pass on that we've been really pleased to be able to sponsor this event. So. Um, been following it for a long time and I've known Darren and Ron for, for many years. Um, but this is the first time we've, we've had the opportunity to actually get behind the event. Um, and I guess our interest in following this event is that, um, so the program I work for, Accelerating Commercialisation, we're always on the lookout for potential companies that we can support with funding and guidance. But our role and, and, and I guess the, the intent of being at events like this is to see companies early. So we like to see companies really early, look at how they're progressing and then when the time's right, if there's an opportunity for us to support them, we know who they are. Um, so it was a great um, selection of pitches today and they should all be congratulated on the work that they've done. So AC, Accelerating Commercialisation, um, whilst we fund companies in every sector, a lot of our funding does go to uh, businesses in the food and agribusiness sector. Um, so of 625 grants that have been awarded since the beginning of Accelerating Commercialisation, there's a total of $310 million. So 103 of those have gone directly to companies in the food and agribusiness sector. And then there's another 144 companies in the advanced manufacturing sector and a lot of those companies building advanced manufacturing products and machinery also address the food and agribusiness sector. So it is a really strong sector for us. So my uh, region that I cover with my colleagues, so Aaron Ty is here today and Josh is out judging, is the South Australian team. We also have a team in WA. Um, so across South Australia and Northern Territory and WA, we tend to see a lot of companies in the food and ag sector. Um, so I guess just a little bit about um, AC, I'm not going to go on about it because you can ask us later if you're interested. Um, but our program's designed to bridge that gap between R&D and commercialisation. Um, so those companies that have developed some new IP but there's still work to do to get it to the commercial market. Um, so seeing companies at this stage is really important for us because they are the companies that will ultimately be the ones that potentially we can fund. So we do that um, by having a team of commercialisation facilitators across the country. There's about 26 of us. Um, and there's a team of four senior facilitators that have been with the program for over, over 10 years to help provide the guidance that those companies need. 
Um, I guess also an opportunity to thank Wine Australia for supporting uh, Ferment over the years. Um, Andrew Hydra Consulting um, for nurturing so many great companies um, that are emerging as being potential companies that we can support on their journey uh, to commercialisation. So happy to take some questions later or if you want to uh, approach Aaron or Josh or myself later on. But that's all I've really got to say today and thanks very much for the opportunity. has any questions that they'd like to ask Grant now because we've got a few minutes um, while we wait for the judges to come in. Yeah. What types of trials do you ask for? Are you asking me? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. We'll get up a slide. Got a question, uh, Jason? Grant, what, what's the criteria then for your equipment program? Um, what sort of company criteria are you look at? Um, you mentioned Sinopoli and uh, Coral and Hardy. Um, yep. And you mentioned the technology and stuff that's been funded. Um, and quite often, you know, we're looking at the price of that product. And I'm wondering what sort of criteria for the government is looking at for the Australian product or equipment? Yeah, primarily. Um, the guidelines state that you need to the applicant needs to be an Australian registered proprietary limited company. Yeah. It does not dictate that you can't have uh, any overseas ownership. Um, the, the applicant company needs to be under $20 million in turnover. Um, they need to have access or ownership or beneficial access to the intellectual property that they're looking to commercialise. So that would be either you have developed it and own it or you have an exclusive licence to commercialise it. Um, I guess they're the main gotchas. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, as with every government program, there, there's, there's devil in the detail. So we're always happy to work through in detail um, with each individual applicant just so that you don't waste any time if it's not going to be a good fit. But if it is, you find out pretty quickly and you can move forward from there. No worries. Any other questions about AC? There's one at the back there. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll preface this with, because we are now under a, a, a new government and we have a new minister, we have visibility up until um, the 30th of June this year, and so the program continues to that point. There is funding in the forward estimates in the budget, but we're not sure what's going to happen in terms of potential changes. So as it stands today, the application process is a two-stage process. So it's a very light-touch application, which is called an application for guidance. It's like an expression of interest. So you fill that out online. You give some general details about your company, your IP, your commercialisation project and how much money you're looking for. Um, and then that gets assessed, gets you into the system and it gets assessed by a commercialisation facilitator and Oz industry for eligibility. And that will sort of lead to a, a more detailed discussion about your project. From that point, we identify whether or not you're a good fit, strong fit for the program. If you are, we invite you to engage in the full application process um, and we assist you through that process. So from beginning to end, if you're really on your game, it takes roughly four or five months to get from, you know, point A to finding out if you're getting funding. Um, but a lot of companies take a lot longer than that. Sometimes it takes longer for them to get in the right position and to get their matched funding. So our program is a dollar for dollar match funding, funding of up to a million dollars um, for projects of minimum 12 months or up to two years in duration. So that's roughly the scope of the project, scope of the funding, time frames. Um, so yeah, so it's four or five, you know, allow six months. No worries. 
and the others. Here we go. I have a question to the Flinders University staff. It uh, seemed like the pitches today, all the, the groups had invented their own technology or their own IP. Is there a program or part of your uh, Venture Institute that matches entrepreneurs up with IP that's available through the university systems where researchers may have developed something and then they don't necessarily want to commercialize it, but it could be commercialized? Is there any kind of programs like that? Uh, if I can say something, <laughs> uh, yes, there is. Um, we we connect uh, researchers with commercialization opportunities, um, and we connect startups with researchers, just like Kikoi, um, the the biomarine uh, CRC, uh, biomarine product CRC is actually a CRC that was won by Flinders University and. Uh, we connected the team there with the researchers so it can happen within the university reaching out the researchers reaching out to the ecosystem to startups but it can also happen that startups through flinders programs get connected to researchers thank you i can probably add a little bit to that um that question so our program also allows for researchers to apply through their university commercialization office so if it's a researcher that's not yet in a business, they can apply for up to 500,000 in funding through the uh, University Commercialization Office, or they have the option to spin that IP out into a company and apply through the normal program. Um, so there's a degree of flexibility depending on where the IP is coming from and, and, and who's working on it. Nora. Thank you. And uh, we're now ready to welcome back the jury in a minute. So thank you very much, Grant. And so uh, thanks for participating in the voting process. Um, I'll now hand over to Darren and Carla, who will present the awards. And as you've seen, there's two tickets to the... Uh, the gala event um, that Wiser put on. Um, I went last year and uh, loved it. Um, and uh, also it looks like some wine, which would be remiss not to include. Um, so they will be here shortly. Oh, Carla's there um, for the 2023 participants. Over yes, to you, Carla. I think we already have uh, a deliberation from the jury and I think that the votes just from the the people just um, just closed so it is um, a pleasure to be here to announce the prizes and uh, if you have seen uh, the prizes are to uh, for each of the the winners um, uh, two tickets to the Wiser Gala uh, dinner um, uh, worth a lot of money and also a box of really uh, nice wine um, that is being um, selected um, and is of very high quality for uh, the winner as well. So these are the, the prizes for each of the winners. And um, it is my pleasure. Is, is there an around? Where is Darren? Oh, Darren is there. Okay. Darren, I'll announce the jury and you announce the people, okay? Because we are a team and I think you also should announce one of them, although you look very nice with the prizes as well. So um, for the jury awards, uh, I, it's my pleasure to announce that Oxen uh, is the winner of the uh of the pitch event for the jury awards and i'm not sure if uh do we have oxen uh shouldn't, online shouldn't they have to be here to win <laughs> uh where is oxen let me go back to the uh participants and see if i can find oxen here andrew andrew are you there so while we wait, Andrew. Andrew. I mean, Andrew's probably gone to sleep. He's in New Zealand. And it's <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm here. Time. Sorry, but I'm on, I'm on, on my phone. <laughs> okay. So, congratulations. You won oh. the jury awards uh, for this final, for Foment's 2023 final pitch event. How do you feel? Oh, oh really excited. Thank you so much. And it was amazing to see all the other companies that uh, pitched tonight. 
a really diverse range of businesses. And um, yeah, thank you all. Much appreciated. When can we expect you in Australia? I'll hopefully there many times this year. So hopefully my face becomes familiar. Okay, we we look forward to that. Uh, there is something about uh, uh, New Zealand participating companies in Foment that always brings uh, a, a lot of excitement to the program and a lot of value added for uh, your industry as well. So we really keep looking forward. Uh, like last year, we had uh, also um, the opportunity to have a New Zealand company then br coming to Australia and then establish here. It will be a pleasure to have you as well. Um, there's always a great benefit from, from that. Um, and I over to you, Darren, to announce the People's Choice Awards. Okay, so just, just before we do that, it is actually a bottle of Tabrex Struy Shiraz and a bottle of um, Derenberg's Dead Arm. And the reason we give those is because those two companies have supported us with Foment from the beginning, and we appreciate it enormously. Um, Andrew, they're going to be stored at my place. <laughs> and I tax all wine that's left at my place, so you can have the bottle that's remaining uh, when you're over here. Fair enough, Darren. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, for me, I get to announce the People's Choice Award because um, I love a good popularity contest. Uh, you can see that because there's been this stupid picture of me up there all day. <laughs> I'm sitting there. I'm right here. There's no reason for my waterfall shot to be showing on the screen all day long. But um, for someone who didn't have a waterfall shot on the screen all day but does do work with water, um, Jay love to you are the people's choice now if i'd been pitching today this would be mine so i'll be taking one of the bottles from you as well thanks darren oh thanks everybody this is fantastic that uh you thought our pitch was was good i really appreciate it uh Every one of these companies, being in the Foment program this year has been fantastic working with all these companies. And the Hydro team and everyone at Flinders has been fantastic too. So I can't thank everybody enough. And I hope I get a chance to chat with everybody, or at least most of you, in the next hour or so. Thanks again. Okay, so just so you know, I did buy all the wine that's out there. Um, and it is uh, all from wineries that support Foment as well. So there may be a couple of, of a relatively obscure brands out there, but if you look on the label and look at the address, you'll see that they're from people who supported us this year. I'd encourage you to drink only wine. And anybody that I see with a beer in their hand uh, will be evicted. Um, and Ron, yes, I did buy way too much just so you know. Um, now, I've got one for Chris and one for Robert from Certified. Um, is Chris here? Um, so, uh, congratulations on your product. I, I just love your product, as you know. I think it's fantastic. Really excited to have you in the program and wish you all the best. Thank you. And as you know, leaving the program doesn't mean you escape. <laughs> so, so, take those, but you still belong to us. So, thank you. Thank you. Hang on. A photo op. You need to get Carla on the back. <laughs> Where do we want to be? Oh, uh, hybrid photo, is it? Get rid of that's better. And you, Darren. Thank you. <laughs> well done. No speeches, no. <laughs> Avron, Avron Rubin from Rubé Wines. Um, and again, it's... Congrats, Avron. Um, and congratulations again. Uh, again, your pitch was fantastic, so thank you. Uh, Greg and Eva Zolozzi. Um, and in terms of how far a business comes through the process, these guys have 
develop through the process as fast as I've seen any company develop, but also to actually close out about three quarters of the deals they need to get seed over the few weeks of the program. Congratulations. Really Congrats. Congrats, Eva. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eva. Clearly not mean enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we... we we definitely have to work around kids in this accelerator. Um, Lado um, is not here. We'll post that to him um, and have a drink with him when he's back in Australia. He's um, online. Oh. Congrats, Lado. And team. Yeah, and um, team. Yeah. Um, so it was um, Enzo, thank you. Uh, you can see me looking for it on my cheat sheet, can't you? Uh, Sydney, congratulations. Um, the first proper technical difficulty of the day, so well done. And James Ahern from, um, from Tato both did the program together. And again, another, uh, another company in the program who I think is going to make a real difference to uh, viticulture in Australia and around the world. Um, Andrew Kersley from Smart Machine. Um, again, obviously a fantastic pitch. Um, and uh, a piece of technology that's right in the middle of the zeitgeist too, I might add. Um, we've got Mishy and Simon. Uh, Mishy and Simon, I would have to say that was the most interesting pitch we've had in the program. Um, I, I, I know that, um, Josh, you said they've got a lot of balls in the air, but it really is an interesting application of both Web 2 and Web 3 technology to create a tool that means anybody can be a retail investor in wine really easily. And I, um, I, I think that that, again, is a, a piece of tech that's going, that has a, a huge opportunity. And Jay, you get to come up here again, but just to shake hands. Thank you all. That's it from me. Carla, have you got anything to add? Just to say thank you to everyone and uh, that uh, unfortunately I'm not there in person to experience all the environment and the vibe that usually goes on. Um, but um, unfortunately I can't be there today and I really hope you now have the time to network um, and to get to know uh, some of the participants, get to know each other, industry. I know that there's some of my students are also in the audience. One of my students, he is working for Darenberg. So uh, if you're there, uh, Jan, sorry to uh, bring the attention to you. Uh, so just really uh, enjoy this time. And I really wish all the success to the participants. Uh, you know that you're always connected to the Foment uh, family. I keep supporting some of the startups even after years um, of uh, them finishing their participation in the program. I love to connect people uh, so as, as well as Darren and all the team. Uh, and you always can count on us to do what we can to help you uh, from this journey onwards. Uh, Foment is just uh, a program to support you. Uh, and you have to have that grit and the resilience to now also get out there and get things done. And, and that resilience sometimes is really challenging especially when we have kids and, and, and busy uh, jobs outside of a startup. So this is a big challenge for some of you, but never give up. And I guess we'll be here along uh, to support you the way we can. And uh, no matter where we are in the world, uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, I know uh, that there will be investors uh, um, that could not make it today. They already asked me for the recording. I know that some already looked at the participants and asked me for certain names and so to make the contact. So I'll be connecting the ones that um, I got uh, the names to be connected to those investors in Europe. 
uh, the ones that I got contacted for some names. So this is uh, just the beginning uh, of a journey here in the Foment family. And I'm really lucky to have met uh, all of you, uh, sometimes in really funny circumstances where, you know, we are hybrid and some have to go, some come in, speakers go, speakers in, uh, exercises, all of the confusion. Uh, but at the same time, um, as you know, this is what allows us to scale foment. And I think the fact that we have startups in New South Wales or, you know, uh, in, in Georgia or in, in New Zealand, uh, if we didn't have this format, it would not be the same experience. Uh, not all the time everything goes uh, in a perfect way, but we try really hard. And a big thank you to Colette, Angela, Ellen, Rev, uh, all the people that are on the background of this and, and um, uh, the, all the other NVI team that is also like doing a lot on the background and, and, and trying to make sure that the participants are connected, have access to resources, uh, have their coffees and, and have food for the ones that come in person. So thank you so much to everyone. Thanks Hydra, thanks Wiser for all of these. And yeah, enjoy the networking and, and the drinks. Uh, I'll try to go and get a glass myself because I'm feeling really, uh, really sad for not being there. That's it. Um, thank you so much to everybody who attended in person and online. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed hearing from, from everyone as well and, and wish all the businesses um, success for their journey um, you, uh, onwards. It sounds like, you know, it's just, this is just the start. Um, and for everyone here today, now's time to go and uh, analyse the wines that uh, Darren's uh, selected for us so, and make a dent. So enjoy. <laughs>